are so thankful that he hears us when we call. Natalia, you ready to give us God's word from the book of Mark? All right, ladies, um, good to be with you. Um, as you can tell, this has been a hard week for my family and myself, so um, the word isn't as concise knit together in my head as I usually would like to have it. So, um, yeah, but uh, I'm excited for Mark. And to be honest, I guess I had to live out the word a little bit closer before I got to speak on it, which usually he has me do, um, because we're going to talk about healing today. <laughs> um, so I uh, guess I had to live it out more. Um, but let me pray for us and then we'll start. Um, Jesus, we thank you that your word um, is true as much today as it was when Mark wrote it. And God, we thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit breathes life onto your, 
onto your word and into us, God, that you're doing a new work in us as we get deep into this gospel. Jesus, we want to see you clear, better, stronger during this time. Pray these things. We need you, Jesus. In your name, amen. All right, so um, before we, I start, I just wanted um, to take, give you a moment to think about which of these passages this week has stuck with you a little bit tighter or more. So I'm going to divide it up. We have the paralytic. If you did your Bible study, it's just basically day one, the paralytic. Day two is Matthew and him being called by Jesus and then, and then having a dinner party where Jesus came and sat with him and his friends. Uh, a fasting passage, a passage on um, the Sabbath. And then the last one is the man who gets healed in the synagogue of a withered hand. So that's what we did these, this last week. Which in, in the top of your you know, notes, whatever you're taking on this morning, which passage maybe the Holy Spirit brought up to you or you kept racking your brain or wrestling with the longest or shocked you the most kind of stood out. I'm going to give you a minute. Are we supposed to answer? No, no, just put it in the top of your sheet. So we're going to, I, I ask that because I want you to sort of take that inventory every week. Like, wow, at the end of, of the day, you could, you know, that really struck me. Or before we meet up at nine o'clock on Tuesday morning, you, you in your morning can be like, wow, this passage really has stuck with me you know, and you can have a conversation with God a little bit more about that. Like why? Um, there's a lot of themes, a lot of things that come up in this, in the gospel. So we just want to keep track of what's kind of hitting you. So I'm going to talk about the paralytic, the, the first story, and we're going to read, read right now a little bit of it, or actually the whole 12 verses. So, um, I'll read for us and then we'll talk about it. So Jesus, um, basically, as you know, the last time we talked, he got baptized, he went into the wilderness, and he started his ministry um, being anointed by God and saying before he even started that he is um, proud of him. So he starts off kind of early healing um, people, and so he cleansed a leper last week, and now he gets to a paralytic. But the story is quite interesting. When he had returned to Capernaum, this is chapter 2, verse 1, in some days it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out, because went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. So this is, um, 
this is kind of one of his, 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 he's getting a reputation for being a healer, right? He's been healing. It's the first kind of thing he does is preach and heal, preach and heal. And so it's so, it's so evident that the word has gotten out that he's a healer, that where he meets, which is said to be in around his hometown, uh, there's crowds. And so on this day, it's so crowded that they can't get in. This, this paralyzed man and his four friends, these five men cannot get in. Now, let's put ourselves in that scenario. The Middle East is usually relatively hot. We don't know if this is in the morning, in the evening. We don't know any of the time. But we do know that, that the homes are not huge. And they also, there was no such thing as deodorant. So I want you to imagine what this scenario was like. It's hot, it's smelly, and, there, and there's a desperation in the air alongside the body odor. There's a desperation for Jesus to heal. There's a lot of sick people all around him. The desperation is so real for these four men and this paralyzed gentleman that they go up and so, and very common in the Middle East still to this day is they have kind of rooftop eating. Um, and so we don't know, if, but there's usually stairs on the side to go to the roof to sort of have like a patio. And so what they did was they carved out a space for this paralyzed man for them to drop him in front of Jesus. There's such a commitment such a oneness, a unity between these five gentlemen to get their sick friend to Jesus. Jesus, when he sees it, remarks upon their faith. He doesn't say, oh, wow, that's a creative idea. Good job, guys. Or, wow, this is a desperate situation. Let's all stop. Let's pause. No, no, no. He's willing to be interrupted with whatever teaching or whatever's going on. And, you know, I'm sorry, but a roof is falling on top of people as Jesus is preaching. Like, parts of whatever that roof was made out of is falling on the crowd. That seems to be a little awkward to me in the middle of a sermon or in a healing and prayer session. But that's what's happening. And Jesus stops and says, noting he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. This is the first time Jesus mentions sins when dealing with healing. Now, if I were one of the four friends and put yourself in the middle, of, you can either put yourself as the paralyzed one who needs to be healed or put yourself as one of the four friends. But we're not allowed to be in the crowd, okay? Whenever we, we study the scriptures, you are not to be identifying with the crowd. I wanna whole, write a whole book about that because I feel like the Christian church just goes along with the crowd. Oh, I'm part of the crowd. I watch Jesus. I observe Jesus. I study Jesus. I look, I wanna be part of the people of faith. No, 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 we're not the crowd. We're either the paralyzed man or we're the four friends. We're not Jesus, but those are the characters in the story. Whenever you read a story, don't identify with the crowd. You got to put yourself as the leper, the bleeding woman, or see down the line, the disciples in the middle of a storm. Like we got to put ourselves in the story. So you're either one of the four friends or you're the paralyzed man. And so... I, I'm putting myself as one of the four friends, though I have many times when I've taught this scripture or been in the scripture, I have identified with the paralyzed man of some kind, some kind of paralysis in my life. But put yourself in there, and there's something about them expecting Jesus to heal, and all of a sudden Jesus whips out, son, your sins are forgiven. I'd be like, wow, Jesus, that's really nice. Um, that's a great thing to have. But we're here for something else. See, our friend can't walk and probably hasn't walked for a long time. So can you touch him and do your thing? 
Like, that's what I would do. I would be like, what are we talking about sins for? But Jesus is actually healing the whole person. Jesus has seen something or he's bringing up a topic that needs to be addressed for the, the scribes and the Pharisees, for the four friends, for the paralyzed man, that sin is part of it. And remember, we talked a lot about repentance being a theme in this, in this, in every gospel, but for sure, Mark makes it one. And so Jesus doesn't wait for him to repent, but he forgives his sins. And so then comes a problem. The scribes and the Pharisees, which we're going to talk a lot about today, they're the leaders of the Jewish law. They're also the leaders of the cultural reality of Jews. Remember, Jews are the minorities in Rome, in the Roman areas. Jews are always the marginalized, very small population. They do everything that they can to keep themselves alive. So Pharisees, Herodians, the Sadducees, the scribes, these are all religious elite, educated, and they're the ones in charge, men, they're the ones in charge of keeping the Jewish law and the Jewish culture as alive as possible. So they are very, very intense about the law. They've been noticing who Jesus is. They probably showed up to see what was going on, what he would do. And Jesus initiated by pulling out one of the hardest things. He has not done this yet. He pulled out a very intense thing. And he's talking about, I will forgive your sins. He is declaring a new authority. He is not a Pharisee. He is not a Pharisee. He is not a rabbi. He is not a popular teacher and healer. He is God. So a new authority is coming to kind of slap the, the religious leaders kind of, it's a whiplash. Like, what are you talking about sins? You cannot forgive sins. You are but a rabbi. You are but a popular teacher. Jesus is fanning the flames. He is causing tension. Nobody else mentioned sins. Nobody else mentioned forgiveness. Jesus goes right for it over this guy. They want healing. He's going for forgiveness. So they question in their hearts, who can forgive sins but God alone? And what does Jesus do? He calls them out. They don't say anything. He says, I know what you're thinking. I know what your heart is saying right now. Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven or rise up and take your mat. You're healed. Okay, so here's one of Jesus' great kind of riddles. And he throws at, and he usually throws it at the religious leaders. And he says, which is easier for you to do? Can you heal or can you forgive sins? For all of us, we cannot forgive anybody's sins. We cannot wipe them clean. And we cannot heal anybody. We don't have the power to do either one of those things. So what Jesus is saying is, I can do it. He's setting himself up apart from a normal traditional rabbi, which they're seeing him as right now. He's, got his, he's getting his men together. He's really popular. He knows a lot about the, the law. He is setting himself apart. He's saying, I'm God. I'm going to forgive your sins, and I'm going to heal you. And by the way, you can do neither. He's breaking, he's breaking what sin has held us captive in. So I'm going to be using these. They're little children's handcuffs, so don't worry. They're not real. Um, but I got them on Amazon, and I barely know how to use them, so obviously they're for the smart kids in the class. Um, but what basically I'm trying to say is that Jesus is coming in, and he's freeing us. And what he does is he frees us, I promise you these keys do work. Yes. He frees us from the captivity of sin. And then he frees this man from 
probably what he had at birth, which is a paralysis, or he got later on, but for many years, a paralysis. He is giving a, a new freedom that the disciples, the scribes, the crowd, the four friends, nobody can give but him alone. So which is easier to say? Neither one is easier to say for a human. We cannot forgive sins and we cannot heal somebody by ourselves. He's setting himself apart and he's giving us a new freedom. And I want to talk to you about the role of the friends. Before we get to Jesus, we're going to spend the rest of the time on, the Jesus, on Jesus. But I want you to understand that when Jesus looks in a sick crowd, we're going to see this throughout this, the gospel, but this is one of the only weeks I'm really going to emphasize healing. And Jesus knew that. And this is the week my mom gets COVID. Well, we're just going to say that that's the Lord doing his usual, traditional, beautiful work. But the role of the four friends Jesus is looking into a crowd and he's looking for one thing. He's not looking for money. He's not looking for status. He's not looking for race. He's not looking for age. He's not looking for class. He's looking, he doesn't look about the, the, what people group this person belongs to. He's looking for faith. Now, when I studied this, or not, when I walked through Mark, and I've walked through it for 12 years straight, so this has been in my blood now, I go, this story absolutely changed the way that I pray. You see, lots of people rely on medicine, and that's what we're sort of groomed to do in America, is to rely on our science, our innovation, all of that. And there's a place for that. But we as believers of Jesus cannot lean too, too heavily on science because science doctors are limited. They're in the same position as these scribes and as the four friends and as the crowd. They cannot heal. Only Jesus' grace allows uh, a certain kind of medicine to work. Jesus's grace allows for us to discover a cure to cancer that we have not had yet. But we've gotten cures for other things, right? But right now, we don't have the cure for COVID. And it's a flu. Talk about humility given to the human race. We got to lean into Jesus. This is the time to be the four friends. When one of us is sick, when one of us isn't well. But see, I've wrestled with this passage because I've prayed for many people to be healed and they have not been healed. And all of us have. And so we get kind of burned. And I'm going to give you a story. Um, my coworker who went through Mark with her students and her campus uh, had um, an amazing time in Catalina going through this one spring break. And they were really captured, and their theme was healing and the authority of Jesus. And so they really took every healing passage and, and were really going deep. Well, it turns out that um, the brother of one of the students had cancer and got very sick and was dying. And so she goes and all of that group goes to pray at the, at the hospital bed for this young brother to, to rise up. And instead, the young man died. And it wrecked these young people's, it like messed with them. It messed with her as a staff worker to see the disappointment and to see like their faith not turn into healing. And so in her own kind of way, she shut down on healing. She shut down on it. She wrestled, she, I mean, she wrestled with her supervisors. She wrestled with her community. And she just said, I'm not praying anymore for healing. It's too devastating. I can't go through that trip. I can't go th on that ride. 
And so many of you maybe can identify with this and feeling the disappointment when you pray for someone to be healed and they're not healed. And then one day the Lord, she, she, she flies away from healing. She runs as far away as she can from that, but the Lord comes back. And one day, a few years later, she had vowed to the Lord. She would never pray for healing. Talk about a bad vow to make. Don't do that. Even in your anger, don't do it. But she vowed. And one morning she's in this Bible study with some women, all different ages. And this lady comes in and she has breast cancer and she comes to Christina and she says, I, and I need you to pray for me. And Christina says, I don't do that. You know, have someone else pray. She took Christina's hand and put it on her breast and said, you must pray for me to be healed. And this, and Christina's having a crazy kind of faith moment. And all of a sudden faith emerged inside of what felt like a dead place in her, in her walk with God and faith rose up and she prayed for the woman and she believed and the woman was healed like supernaturally, miraculously, all the cancer was gone. And so Christina has to wrestle with that. Like, what was that about? And so I, I have, I have also had to wrestle with my, um, I prayed for this person to be healed and they died. And this has happened many times. And then I prayed for this pet, this person's knee and it got healed. And I prayed for this person and it got, they got healed. And, and, you know, you just, but, but what I've come to notice is that whatever happens, my responsibility, my role is of a woman of faith, a daughter of faith, because that's what he's looking for. Now, whether I can, I, whether I can make sense when he does it or when he doesn't do it, it's not up to me, but I am responsible for being that friend that comes, comes in faith. I don't want to be part of the crowd that just watches things happen. I'm going to be either the one getting healed by Jesus, or I'm going to bring my friend to Jesus and, and pray with faith to be healed. It's so vital because when I get to heaven, I don't want him to say you missed some opportunities because you didn't put faith there. I want him to say you were, you asked and you asked and you were relentless about asking. You're shameless about asking. I loved that. He's not offended when we ask for healing. He's, in, he's excited to see faith. What he does with it, it's part of his sovereign plan that I'm not going to get this side of heaven. Even when he does heal, I don't get it. But what I do get is my role is I can be a, a person of faith. We're going to see in the scriptures where faith shines and where they missed it. And there was no faith whatsoever. But Jesus is looking for one thing all day long, every day. All day, every day, Jesus is looking for faith in him.